Hi, hello everybody. So, you want to be a rock star. Don't worry, everybody secretly wants to be a rock star. So, what does it take to become a rock star? Well, step one. You need to master your instrument, or multiple instruments if you play many of them. But, there's a very important step number two. And that is that you need to learn to play in a band. As a rock musician, you're always on stage with other people. You're always playing in a team. So if you want to be a Python rock star, because that's your instrument, then you need to learn to play well with your band, which is your team of other programmers. And there are tools that can help you work together, play together better. And those things are standards, things that we can all agree on, best, best practices that we found that work for us the best, and tools that can actually check how well we're doing following these standards and best practices. So, hello, my name is Michał Korzyński. I uh, come to you from Poland, like uh, was said, and uh, I work at Intel on a very uh, interesting open source project called NGraph, which is a, a deep learning graph compiler, which I'm sure you will be hearing a lot about in the coming uh, years. But um, I was in my spare time doing some, uh, playing a, a, around a little bit with uh, the OpenAI gym. I don't know if you know this, it's a reinforcement learning uh, environment where you can teach an agent to play some, solve some puzzles or play some games. And what I found was that there wasn't actually a very good way to found, find out information about uh, environments that you have installed locally. So uh, I was playing around with these environments. There, there are very good APIs that you can use to uh, explore these environments. So I wrote up a little tool that, uh, that is able to help you explore these environments. And I'm gonna show you that a little demo right now, if I can figure out how to get my mouse pointer over there. There you go. So this is just a command line utility. You just type something in. It uh, shows you the environments that you have installed on your computer. It you, helps you pick the right environment for yourself. And you can watch a random agent play Space Invaders and die quite quickly. But you also get in the background some information uh, about the rewards that it's getting for, uh, for, for as it's playing, which is helpful when you're developing your own uh, algorithm in the gym. So, okay, I've done that, and I thought, this is a very small thing, but it could be useful to others. So, maybe I can release this as a package, maybe somebody will be able to use this to play around as they are preparing to write their reinforcement learning algorithm for playing in the gym. So, then I thought, all right, if I want to release this as an open source project, what will it take? And uh, I wanted to get, like, put all these tools and best practices that I've learned from working on a larger open source project into this tiny open source project. And these are all the things that uh, I found I needed to, uh, to use. So my, my, my slides will be tagged with these little bubbles. Uh, and you can, um, the first set of bubbles shows you stages. So you can prepare, you, you first you need to prepare your code for some of these things. Then you can automate some of the things that I will be talking about. And finally you can put all of this into a nice CI environment for continuous integration. The little tags with a book icon show you like references for uh, more information about this, things you can Google for. Uh, the, but the tags with no icon at all are just things you can pip install, the names of packages you can pip install, and the uh, tags with a little uh, external link arrow are names of services that uh, I will be talking about, which will come up on some slides. So that's the legend for the next slide. But okay, let's start. So if you want to uh, write a command line utility, you need to define your 
user interface. Your user interface in this case is your command line interface. And the expectation of a user when he's coming to some utility is that the command line interface will work, work like this. If you type in the name of the utility with no, uh, with no other options, it'll give you like this one line short description of what the syntax is, a reminder of what the syntax of the command is. If you want to find out more, you, uh, you do the dash dash help thing and you get the longer description of uh, the interface. And then you can provide the options, the values for the various options, either with long names or short names. So that's what a good uh, command line interface uh, looks like and actually it's uh, written up in GNU guidelines for, for command line interfaces. So how can you do this? Well, actually, very easily, there's a tool that I like very much, uh, a package called docopt, which allows you to define your entire command line interface just by writing a doc string for your, uh, for your script. So you just write this documentation once and uh, it acts as the help text that will come up when the user uh, uses dash dash help, but it also becomes the, uh, the input to uh, the docopt function which is provided by the library which parses all the arguments, takes all the uh, values from the user from the command line and gives you back uh, a list of uh, argument values that you can use directly in your script. So that's the, that's the first tool uh, I want to recommend to you, docopt, but there are of course other things, uh, other uh, ways you can approach the same uh, problem. Okay, so now we have a script with a nice command line interface What's the next step? Well, the next step is to put all of this in a, 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 in a project, in a package. So this, the, the way we, uh, the, the standard we have in Python for laying out uh, code in, in a directory that, goes out, that will go up on GitHub is like this. You, the root directory will be the directory for your entire package. And then inside of that, you'll have uh, a, a readme file, a setup py file, uh, some, uh, some source code, which can either go into a, a directory named the same as your module, or better yet, just a directory called at source. And then you may have some tests and some docs. So that's, uh, that, that's where you can put your, uh, your code. Okay, so that's ready. Now, the next step I was thinking about, okay, so, uh, what should I do next? Well, I have to refactor my code a little bit. So it's not just one big long function that does everything, but is going to be something more maintainable. Maybe I'll have some contributors coming in, maybe they want to add some features. It's good to prepare the code in some way that we can all uh, use to work together uh, on later. And so I'm just going to mention the uh, the standard I think that we should all be following, uh, which is the clean code guidelines uh, from the uh, famous book by uh, Uncle Bob Martin, Robert C. Martin. Uh, and the TLDR of, uh, of clean code is basically that you should just write small single purpose functions with meaningful names, with arguments that have meaningful names, each function serves a single responsibility, doesn't take many parameters. Uncle Bob says that two is the most that you should have. And preferably no side effects and that allows you to uh, write things that you can easily test. So you should write unit tests for each one of them. Okay, so some refactoring done. Let's, uh, uh, let's get to the next step. Well, now the good practice that we are all following is to use this construct where we're uh, in our uh, module using if name equals main, then we execute the function. This, this actually does two things. One, allows you to import the code from, from, from the module in another file, uh, and refactoring the main function into a separate function <laughs> will come in handy uh, very soon when I'm talking about uh, entry points in a second. So, um, the next step, 
is to prepare a setup py file. Now this is actual setup py file that I wrote. It's not perfect, but there was a talk yesterday by, uh, by Mark Smith about writing the perfect, uh, preparing a perfect PyPY package. So you should check that out on uh, YouTube afterwards if you haven't seen it. But this is basically all you have to write to, to, get, a, um, to get setup tools to package up your code. And this, the arrow is pointing to a little trick that you can do to, uh, if you have a readme file written in Markdown, just use that as the long description for your, for your package that will later be available on PyPY. So I recommend doing that. Um, then, uh, if you already have a setup py file, you can use it, of course. The basic use of a setup py file is to prepare your packages. So you can either uh, prepare a source package or a binary uh, distribution package, uh, a wheel, which you can then upload uh, to PyPY. Um, but you can also use setup py, and you should be, sh should be using it this way, uh, during local development. So you can actually, inside of a virtual environment that you created for working on your project, uh, use setup py with the develop option to install it locally. Another way to do this, maybe even better, is to pip install dash e and the current directory, the dot indicates the current directory where the setup py file is, uh, which will actually just uh, call pip to uh, call setup py dot develop through pip, but allows pip to uh, handle all the uh, dependencies as well. So, uh, another thing that setup py allows you to do is to define entry points. And this is, this is a very useful feature of setup tools that not everybody uh, takes advantage of. Entry points allow you to actually combine uh, multiple packages into systems where, of plugins. So you can have a main package and you can have other packages that, uh, that are plugins for that package and these things can be defined through entry points. But a very simple use case for entry points is to define the console scripts uh, entry point which just gives you, which just creates a command. So my command in this case will become the command that you can call, that your user will be able to call at the command line uh, after they install your package. And this syntax here maps to a specific function in a specific file in a specific module uh, with this notation. So if you want to write a command line utility, you should probably write a console script entry for your, in your setup py file. Okay, so next, Next subject uh, that you need to take care of is requirements. And this is a big subject which I will only be able to uh, skim over uh, due to time limitations. But the gist of it is that you need to provide a, a way for your users to set up an environment that it resembles your environment uh, as closely as possible. And the way I use um, requirements TXT is to provide a list of specific packages at specific versions that I've tested the, uh, the um, package with. And this is, uh, this is very useful for, for, for your users to then find out, okay, if it's not working for them, maybe one of the dependencies is at a different version. So the simplest way to create a requirements file is to use pip freeze uh, and then uh, you can uh, install these with pip install and uh, I would recommend separating uh, requirements and that you need for the actual uh, running of installation of the package from the ones that you only need for testing uh, because that will come in handy later when you're automating some CI processes. So I'm not going to get into uh, pipenv or other uh, approaches to handling requirements, but you should look into those uh, if you're curious. Okay, next, next best practice. This is official now, I think. We should all use black. So it's very simple to use. Uh, you just install it and then you just run it on your source code and it just reformats the hell out of it. 
but it does it in a consistent way. So you may not like it, but it's the way we, <laughs> the, the, the way it works is consistent and we can all agree. And that's the, it's, it's a huge value that we don't have to argue how we're going to be formatting commas at the end of lines. There's a way that standardized and, uh, you know, let's just all stick to it. So, uh, black is just one formatter that you can use. You can actually have uh, a number of them, and if you, if you use them, then a very good practice is to use them together with a pre-commit. Pre-commit is a simple tool that you install, and then the first time you want to use it, you, you run this command pre-commit install, and it sets up a git pre-commit hook for running all of your uh, code formatters. So with, uh, if you want to use pre-commit with black, then um, the uh, configuration file on the left, uh, which you should store in the special uh, YAML file called dot pre-commit config, will set up, uh, will download black from the internet and prepare it for, uh, for running. And then the next time you want to commit a change, you type git commit, that will trigger black and run it on all your files. And if anything is changed by black, meaning that it had to be reformatted, it will prevent you from actually committing the change. So it's a good, uh, useful tool for very quickly checking your formatting before you even commit the change. Another good way to test if you're actually following uh, all the standards is, is to use a code linter. Now, my favorite is Flake 8, but uh, there are of course many others. And why I like Flake 8 is that it has this plugin architecture that I uh, described before. So you have Flake 8 as the main module that you install, but then there are many, many other uh, Flake 8 uh, packages that you can add onto it. Uh, and in this list, you just have the ones that I like to use. You can find others. Uh, they can look for, they, they can test uh, not just compliance of your code to PEP8, which is of course the uh, requirement that the, the standard we should all be following, but also it can look for some bugs, uh, common, uh, common mistakes that are made, uh, sorting of your imports with iSort and other things that, that, that you like to have in your code. It can all be tested with these Flake 8 plugins. It's very easy to configure. You can put your con the configuration in talks any in the Flake 8 section and define some, uh, define some uh, values like line length. Now, because we should all use black, the official line length became 88 because it has a 10% tolerance for at 80 uh, line length and a 10% tolerance. And uh, you can exclude some uh, checks from Flake 8 if you want by uh, adding this ignore <laughs> instruction in there. And now if you run the Flake 8 command, it will load all of these plugins, run your code, all of your source code through all of these tests and inform you if you're missing something or if something is, mis uh, is not formatted correctly or maybe you have a, a common uh, bug or a security fault that you didn't notice somewhere in your code. So this is very useful. Another useful uh, check is MyPy and the uh, type annotations that are now available in Python 3. This takes a bit more work because you actually have to do the type, like add the type annotation to all of your code. But if you do it, it pays off because you can do static type analysis of your code before you actually, uh, before you commit it. So this um, will check if any where in your entire code base, you're calling something with the wrong type of argument. And this can sometimes find bugs that you, that are silly, that you really didn't mean to do, but 
somehow you put the wrong, uh, you're calling a function with the wrong, uh, with the wrong variable, for example. And normally you would have to find that somewhere and uh, fix it, but MyPy can find these types of issues for you very quickly uh, without even running your, um, your code. So use MyPy uh, for, for this purpose if you, if you have the patience to put the type annotations everywhere, but I recommend it. Okay, so now we have some checking. How do we put it all together? Well, the tool that everybody's recommending these days is Tox, and Tox is very uh, simple uh, to configure, and it can put all of your tests together into one thing. So, the, a, a simple Tox configuration is um, written in the box on the left, and it um, defines a list of environments that will be tested, in this case Python 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, and then the definition of the testing environment, the dependencies, the commands we want to run, and even some other configuration sections can be put all into this one Toxini file, even for other tools. So with this setup, all you have to do is run the tox command, or if you want to run just a single environment, you can run the tox command with the dash E option and the name of an environment, and it will Start by creating a virtual environment for that specific version of Python, installing all the dependencies into that environment, installing your packaging up your code and installing it into the uh, virtual environment and then running the commands. So all of your tests, like here I have Flake and PyTest, but you can build on top of that. All the tests that you need can be run with one call, of, call to talks. So that's very useful and it'll come in handy in a second when we're putting this all in, in a CI system. But if we're going to be testing things, well, we need to write unit tests. So this is where refactoring of the code into small functions comes in handy because now you can write simple unit tests for each function. And um, the, um, the test tool that I think is becoming uh, more and more popular all the time is PyTest. It's really easy to use. You can write tests with minimal boilerplate. Just, uh, just, just import your function, run it, and put some assert statements uh, into a test, and, and you have a test. And that's all you have to do, so it's easy to get started. And then you just run the, all the tests with a simple call to the PyTest command. Okay. So now we've got all the code preparation, pre all the code is prepared. Everything is done. We're ready to, to, to share with the community a pretty uh, robust project. So what do we do? Well, of course, we put it up on, uh, in a Git repository. These days, GitHub is king, but GitLab, of course, is a popular alternative, and, and there are, there's Bitbucket as well, so I'm not going to, to recommend uh, just GitHub, but it is the one that has best integration for all the tools that I will be talking about from now on. So you just set up a Git repository, put all your add all your code to the repository, and push it to, um, to the repository. If you're creating a repository, remember to put a gitignore file into your uh, Git repository and the license. The license is the thing that's easy to forget, but it's critical. If you don't put a license in your code, no one can use it. Uh, so uh, put, the, uh, put the license, uh, set up the uh, Git repository, and then you can proceed to setting up a continuous integration environment. Uh, I like to use Travis, but of course, as with everything, there are alternatives. But Travis is easy to use because you just prepare a simple, another YAML file, you just drop another YAML file into your repository, and uh, when you uh, put one like this that calls Tox, that one Tox, that one call to Tox will run all your tests. So uh, if, you, if you do that and you set up a, uh, an account on Travis and add your repository to that, uh, to that account, the uh, testing will start and 
you will start seeing uh, these little checks on all the PRs that you make to your repository, which are very useful. Even for yourself when you're writing code, you can uh, go through the PR process of your own changes and see if it passes all the tests. Another useful uh, tool that's available for free for uh, anybody uh, who has an open source rep uh, repository on GitHub is uh, a requirements updater. I like to use PyUpBot specifically for, for Python uh, requirements, but there's also Dependabot, which is free for uh, other languages as well. So there's no configuration required. You just uh, set it up by creating an account and giving it access to, to, uh, to your repository. And then the bot will scan your requirement file and figure out if they're up to date with versions of PyPI. If they're not, then it will start creating pull requests with updates to specific versions of packages. And if you have a CI process in place, then you will know which ones you can merge and which ones you can't, because the ones you uh, can merge are the ones that have a green check marks, and the ones that tests fail for will have a, will, will have a cross. So that's very useful. OK, another useful, things, another useful thing is to check your test coverage. The uh, PyTest library and other Python unit test libraries can actually check which lines of your source code were hit when running your test suite and then give you a report. So this is actually very easy to use. For PyTest, you just uh, add this dash dash cov option, specify your module, and then you'll get a report for, for your module. If you want more information, you can ask for a HTML report, and that will generate a code coverage report in an HTML, uh, in a HTML files, which show you exactly which lines of your source code are tested and which ones are not being tested. So you can, uh, so you can uh, see where you still need to add code, uh, add tests, and then. The, you, you can actually integrate this with another service online, which will track the test coverage over time and maybe even prevent you from merging changes which decrease the uh, code coverage uh, on your, uh, in your repository. Another thing I want to mention is code review. If you're working as a team, the best thing you can do for each other is, is, is review each other's code. The people you work with uh, have the chance and you have the chance to tell them which part of the music they're playing you really like and which one you think should be a little better and that's the, the moment to do this is during code review. But you can also, there are also services now and I think they're getting better, although they're far from perfect yet, that do automated code review. So you can sign up for something like uh, Codacy or Code Climate, and it will actually look at all the PRs in your repository and find things that may be wrong with this code and give you, uh, give, make a code review on your PRs. Okay, another bot you can employ is something that will automatically merge PRs. So mergeify.io is one that I uh, recently set up. And you can configure rules that uh, apply to your PR, and if a PR matches these rules, then it will get automatically merged. For example, this is a configuration for automatically merging a PR that has passed CI and has at least one positive review. And uh, if your PR matches this, then Mergeify will merge it, and you can even set up a different rule that will delete the old branch. So if you have all this in place, you actually have bots working for you. The PyUp bot will find updates to packages uh, on PyPI. Travis will test if these packages are, uh, uh, are, are passing your tests. And if everything passes, Mergeify can merge these PRs. So without you doing anything, you can have your uh, project be kept up to date with its dependencies on PyPI. So, I'm getting to the end of my story. Now you're ready to publish your, uh, your project on PyPI. This is very easy. We have a tool called Twine. Uh, so once your packages are built, you can upload them uh, to Twine if you just need to set up a, uh, an account on PyPI. And your package is published, and you're happy, and everybody can use it. So I wrote up uh, all the 
details. I know it, this went fast, but everything that I said is in an article on my blog, so you can read it at your own pace. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michal, for this very interesting talk. Do we have questions for Michal? Hold on, hold on. No. So, um, yeah, I haven't set up uh, an automated documentation for this particular project because there isn't much documentation, but uh, I'm torn between uh, Sphinx and Make Docs because I'm a fan of Markdown, so I don't like restructured texts, which makes me biased against, uh, against Sphinx, but I think Sphinx is very powerful and I've seen it used good effect by people, so I guess in the right hands. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have another question for Michal? Yes, let's use the microphone for the recording. Uh, recently I worked in an uh, automated versioning and I came to bump to version together with a script that I made myself. Do you know some tool to do it um, in an automated way? or we have to do it ourselves at the moment? To, uh, to bump the version of, your, uh, of, of the yeah, code that you're writing. That you don't have to uh, either change it in a script mm -hmm. or uh, yeah, is there some tool a, uh, That's a good question and I don't think I have encountered a tool that actually does this. So, so far I've been doing it manually, but it would be a good, good thing to, to automate. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We have one more question over there, I'll come to you. Um, do you know if there's a way to install pre-commit globally or as a Git uh, repo template? Because my experience is uh, people forget to install pre-commit hooks when they start new projects. Well, if they forget to install pre-commit, they will pay for it during uh, <laughs> after they commit because they will, the, the PR will not pass your tests. So they, it's, it, it benefits them to install it. So, so they'll have motivation to do it at some point. Do we have more questions? Raise your hands. Okay, so if we don't have further questions for Michal, another round of applause for Michal.